Hi, and welcome to Talkward. I'm Marty Dundix, Editor-in-Chief of Weekly Humorous Magazine, and this is Talkward, a fun little podcast where professionally funny people come to tell awkward and cringeworthy stories. Do you have an awkward or cringeworthy story, Mike Sachs? I didn't know it was that had to do with the cringe factor. <laughs> wow. Cringe factor. Oh, I have plenty of cringe. I'm very excited to welcome today's guest. Uh, I haven't seen him in a while, but we live uh, down the street from each other in beautiful Park Slope, Brooklyn. Um, he is the author of many, many, many comedy books. Um... That have been uh, adapted and readapted for audio and then novelized and all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah, no one knows what's going on, including me. He, he's developed his, his own uh, fun comedy sandbox to play in. Please welcome Mike Sachs to the show. Hi, Mike Sachs. Hello. That sandbox doesn't produce much change. <laughs> I just got to shake it out. <laughs> yeah. I want to ask you, too. I want to ask you some questions today. Okay. My main question is this. You're a talented man. Thank you. You used to work for National Lampoon. Yeah. Well respected. Mm -hmm. What made you stick with print? And when I mean print, I don't mean hard copy necessarily. I mean web or anything written. The written word, written comedy. What made you stick with that? It, budget wise, it's it's something I can achieve. I'd like to move into TV development. I have moved into TV development, and I'd love to do movie stuff, but. Uh, and, and web videos, all those things cost a lot to make. And even if you spend lots of money on them, a lot of them turn out terribly, right? But with print, I know print. My background was in print. I went to school. I went to Syracuse for illustration. Um, so I started out in the New York Press, which was a weekly Village Voice competitor. And I know publishing. Like, I know the schedule. I know readership i know that even though it's an old medium it's been around for a long time and people still like it you know i I feel like that was a world that i was comfortable in so i like i like it and i i can do it and i would love to branch out to other things but i am comfortable doing i did radio when i was growing up in college and a little bit after so i like podcasting and i like web publishing because i just i know how to do it um, and I feel like there is so much talent out there. There are less places to publish, and I kind of got to slip in and be a publisher and be a platform that people have now um, started wanting to be on. And because of that, I'm benefiting, right? I I have all these talented people, a lot of these cartoonists from Mad and from The New Yorker, a lot of writers from McSweeney's and from Mad and from The New Yorker. And because there's only a couple of places like Mad and the New Yorker to be published, because Weekly Humorous was able to slide in there, I've become a place where they want to be. And that's great for me. So it's like a destination. So that's why I was able, that's why I like sticking with publishing. And it's even, even more backwards. I am a web publisher who's now trying to go and make, this is a hard copy of Weekly Humorous. So we're going to be taking the, the digital web issues that are on an app right now, and we're going to go even more backwards, and we're going to be publishing each back issue. There's been like 56 issues. Those are going to be available for purchase, and then moving forward, we're going to be doing that every week also. I think that's great. It's, it's fun. It's like American Bystander, which I love. It's like, be the... Everyone's going to the right. Go to the left. But you know what's you know? funny? I don't think everyone has. Well, first, I, I have a lot to talk about. But my question. But that's an interesting answer. So you would rather do what you want, how you want to do it for yourself, rather than potentially making a ton of money working for someone else on someone else's project, be it TV or. Oh project. yeah, like that's the whole. Why are you doing this? Why not just go get a job at like a big company that does stuff and actually pays you? That's a great question. Um, I, I think it terrifies me. It's a world I don't know how to. I don't know how to be in. Mm. I think I had a, a bit of that where maybe around 2010, I did a bunch of interviewing and I I had my resume set up because I worked at National Lampoon for like 13 years and the place was a nut house, and that's been covered. And I tried to go into the real world and I had all these interviews and they were great. And then I didn't get it because a lot of them promoted from within. But I went it for like big time interviews at like Comedy Central and places that were like great jobs and it would have been great i didn't get them and that was fine but i had the experience of almost getting my foot into that really the problem was i was interviewing for things that were way at the top because that was the level i was at at the time if i had been able to get in bottom middle maybe i would have been more comfortable sliding into a big like a viacom type company job but then by the time um things at lampoon went south 
I was at a level that I couldn't get in at the level I wanted. I would have had to start over. So I, I was just like, I'll just start my own thing and be the boss. I don't understand that. Why? And I, I've witnessed that is you're certainly capable of doing that job. But unless you come in house and unless you've done exactly what they want you to do, and unless it's a, a, um, a complete and utter uh, match, they won't take the chance on you. I've seen yeah. that, not not with you in particular, but with me and others. It's just you need to have exactly what they want, and they can't. Ha- they don't often have the creativity to piece together that you are capable of making that leap. Yeah, like the the place. I was so excited. It was um, it was a Comedy Central, New York based. It would have been one under what Lou Wallach was before he the great Lou left. Wallach. The great Lou Wallach. So I would have been like his second in command, but it was this other woman who was running it. And it was like New York production development for Comedy Central East Coast. And I interviewed great and I knew all the right people and I recommended the right new and up and coming stand up comics. And it was all it was wonderful. I felt amazing. And then it went to someone who did comedy at MTV Mm -hmm. and they just moved over from MTV comedy right over to Comedy Central, which is a logical move for them. And maybe they only interviewed me because they needed to interview outside people. Mm. But it was a great experience, right? And the person who I interviewed with did not last there very long, and they, all the TV shows that they had, like, uh, you know, I had to, I had to like do a homework assignment, so I had to do like uh, uh, read through some treatments and do some coverage and recommendations based on a couple of shows, and it was really interesting. And my opinions were that these were terrible, and then it turns out that they had already green lit mm-hmm. them, mm-hmm. That's and they not la- fair. it's not. And the shows were terrible. I was right. That's they got fair. canceled. She got fired. Mm-hmm. So fine. Well, that's the but thing. I was right. <clears throat> and you know, you probably wouldn't have enjoyed the job anyway. I mean, I ask this question because I go through this all the time. Should I become a writer for someone else? And I've done it, and I was miserable, mm. and make more money, or should I do my own thing? And and do a more of a punk aesthetic, a garage band type of thing, exactly what I want, how I want to do it, and put out the product that I want without necessarily making that much money. And I, I, I definitely lean towards the latter. I think there's a lot to be said for uh, your, how you produce. You know, no one goes into writing to write jokes for shit your dad says, right? Right. Okay, and I know people who wrote for that show. You you go into it because you, you love comedy and you, you have favorite comedies, you make your friends laugh, and you want to do what you want to do, which is why I love that you're doing this because it allows a lot of people to do something, to publish a piece, whether it's an illustration or written, that wouldn't be wouldn't find a home otherwise. Yeah. And what I, what's interested me, I don't know if you found this. I mean, for many years, I, I worked in the wilderness. I, it seemed like I was the only one working in print. I mean, of course, that wasn't the case. But everyone wanted to write for TV. Everyone wanted to write for movies. I felt like, you know, an old-style accountant with a green visor and the old-style you know, old desk and lamp. But now it seems like there's been a real resurgence with, uh, I hate to sound like an oldster, but with young writers, younger mm-hmm. writers, especially female writers, which is amazing, and there seems to be a real resurgence for wanting to write for print and a love of print humor, which yeah. I hadn't seen, say, 10 years ago. It was sort of in the doldrums. And I don't know what happened. I, I, I did not predict this at all. I thought it would go just the opposite. But it seems that more people are enjoying writing and publishing in print, I think, because they can express their creativity the way they want to. Yeah. And they can't do that elsewhere. But it's a, I think it's a fantastic thing to see. It's like the satire festival yeah. that was held recently. That, that was incredible. Terrific. I mean, what those women are doing, I think, is fantastic. And the fact there's so much interest for it, I mean, it's just great. And it's just sort of shocking to me. Yeah. And they're so they're so nice. Like, Caitlin Kunkel She's is, the, sweetest, is yeah. the head of my book club, which I love my book <laughs> club. And we all went to the ballet on Monday together. And... Uh, they're, everyone's so smart, you know, and it's, you know, my, my, my book club is, is these amazing accomplished people and I'm meeting so many people who are in the comedy business who are, you know, like Gigi Lee's in my book club, like all these really wonderful writers, but we're just hanging out talking about books and it's more of like a social club and we talk about TV and we talk about politics and it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's like this salon 
and I just I it's so I, I appreciate being a part of it. I feel always like kind of the dumbest one in the room, which is I'm used to, and I just try to soak up other people's knowledge. Right, it's um, a community that I haven't seen since maybe early McSweeney's. Yeah, you remember those days where you know you would go out and there'd be seemingly hundreds of people, you know, not necessarily for what you had written for the site, but to see David. Yeah. Um, and uh, which was fine. I mean, it, it, he was, he did an amazing job bringing people to print. But it sort of um, went. I thought it, it sort of the interest lessened for a while. But now there I was a book up. that I think. Are you on the first book for McSweeney's? It was uh, something written in darkness by by like. Uh, Is that uh, the list book? S- scared Americans or huddled Americans or. I'm sat- in a list book and. Then- I'm coming up with another book, but I don't think I'm in like that one way. of the first published books. I think from McSweeney is one of my favorites, and written in darkness by something Americans. I can't remember, but it was a lot of like Hodgman, and it was a lot of like um, Michael Ian Black. It was like a lot of like the, I think maybe the first wave of writers that kind of set the Neil tone. Neil Pollock, yeah, mm-hmm. it's great. I love those books. And it's a long time ago. That was twenty years ago. It's crazy. Yeah. So a whole new generation came up reading it, being influenced mm-hmm. by McSweeney's, which I find incredible because I didn't grow up reading it. I was too old. But the fact that people got into humor writing because of McSweeney's and got into that sensibility because of McSweeney's, I think is incredible. You know, t- to me, it was always National Lampoon. And although I was too young for the, the early years, but Mad Magazine, uh, but the McSweeney's sensibility, you can see it everywhere now. Yeah. It was written in darkness by troubled Americans. That's the name of the book. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay, sorry. You've been writing for a long time. You've written a ton of books. I just read something uh, you wrote on Slackjaw. Yes, um, right. About the old the old man dating the right. millennials. And I just got a woman saying, "You're a sick old man. You're you're just sick." But um, I mean, you're making fun of, of old course people. Of course, I am. I'm making. Listen, I was on the dating scene recently. Um, I got divorced and I was back on the dating scene mm-hmm. and this is just making fun of me out there, not knowing what the hell to do. You know, it's, it's uncomfortable. I am also uh, single on the apps and, um, the idea of dating somebody, cause now I'm 40 and I lived my life up until my 40th birthday. I, I had the mindset of like a 28 year old mm-hmm. for all of my thirties. And I kind of got away with it because I have kind of like a youthful yes. look yes. and I just felt young. And then I felt like I turned 40 and within a month I felt 40, mm-hmm. you know, like I went from 28 to 40 in about seven days. Well, a lot of it's psychological. Yeah. I mean, the whole point, the whole point of the piece was making fun of me. You know, I have to put on my bifocals to eat pussy. Well, obviously I don't do that. I don't wear bifocals. I don't do that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, who would think that that was offensive, you know? That I only... <laughs> Eat young pussy by eating by putting on my both bifocals and really look at what I'm doing. Really detailed. You got to really look in there, right? I mean, like you know, stuff like holding the condom at arm's length so I could read the instructions. I mean, there's all jokes, and the fact that people would be upset by that. But it, boy, I tell you, people are so ready to be upset these days. They're just itching to be upset. Is that also the fun of being in print? Is you don't get to hear people's immediate yes, reactions? Absolutely. Well, yeah. there's no comment section in a book. There's a negative and a positive. I mean, yeah. it's very lonely. You know, when I put out a book, I'll occasionally run into someone who said, "Oh, I like that piece." I'm not going to the movie theater and hearing a reaction. I've done live readings. Like I opened for David Sedaris a couple of times. That is like a rock and roll show, not for me, but for him. I mean, the crowd goes insane. When he sits at home, he doesn't have that. When I sit yeah. at home, I don't have that. There is. It's good to have some reaction. It's also good not to have reaction. I don't. I never read the comments. I don't have executives breathing down my neck. There's no money involved. There's no um, focus groups that I have to go through. So there's it's a positive and a negative. I mostly it's a positive where I can just do my own thing in my own world. But it does you do feel kind of isolated. You've been doing your own thing in your own world more and more. You've invented your own path, and I love. I mean, we can talk about your most recent books. You and I don't even know. I mean, how did you come up with Stinker Let's Loose? Well, that was so. This is a book that's yeah. like a Smokey and the Bandit, right? Right. This is a novelization to a fictional movie from 1977 called Stinker Let's Loose. It's a fry battered CB and trucking. I love the CB radios. Oh, I was obsessed with it as a kid. I was really as a young. kid. I loved CB radios. I yeah. wanted them. I when I had the opportunity to use them, it was always like break or break. Well, everyone had them. I mean, my four foot eight Jewish aunt had one. She was Honey Bear. 
that, that was uh, <laughs> everyone had them at, at one point they were the uh, they were the precursor to the internet they were how you reached out to other people it was a whole different world a whole different lingo and it seems that these movies i mean i showed it to my 10 year old daughter smoking the bandit and she might as well have been watching a movie from you know the early 19th uh, 20th century i mean mm-hmm. it, she was no connection at all the very strange, it came on very strong. In the mid to late 70s, the southern rural was, was all the rage, and then it became northern urban mm-hmm. as far as pop culture. I love the southern culture of, of those years. It just reminds me of growing up. And when, those, when the heroes were on the roads, they were blue-collar truck drivers. They were, they were the, uh, you know, they, they would take to the road for adventure, and they would get the girls, and they would, they would take care of smoking and all that. So I always love those those books. So what happened was that I had been writing for many years for Esquire and, you know, New Yorker and McSweeney's and Vanity Fair. And I had a bad experience um, with a freelance piece uh, at Esquire. And um, I just, I I just thought I, I, I want to do what I want to do. And I had been reading a lot of older interviews, Playboy interviews with George Carlin, Richard Pryor, and at all points in these guys' lives, they started off traditional, but then they broke apart. And it became not for the money and not for the fame, not for anything, but to appease themselves. And that's when they really exploded. So I thought, I don't want to write jokes for Esquire anymore. I don't want to do that. I don't want to write jokes or pieces that I don't even come up with the ideas. They come up with the mm-hmm. ideas. I just want to do what I want to do. And it occurred to me that, you know, I wanted to do this idea for a while, a novelization to a fictional movie Mm -hmm. because I could then create an entire movie world without creating a movie. Right. I could, I could put in fake movie stills. I can put in a fake biography. I can put in a fake interview about the book and write the movie. So that's what I did. And this is when I had first, Oh, also it was a, it was a personal issue too, because I had been separated and I was, you know, sort of reinventing myself in the world and I just thought, I don't really care if anyone reads this. I just want to get it out. I think it'd be kind of cool. Mm-hmm. You know, almost like um, a record from Discord Records by Ian Mackay of Fugazi or something. Like, I'm just going to put it out for five bucks and hopefully a few people will like it. And I put it out there. And when you put something out there that you like, good things tend to happen. And because of that, someone got in touch with me, said, can I produce it? And I was like, sure. Uh, and I didn't really think anything of it. Uh, and this guy, Eric Martin, sold it to Audible and got a cast that you, you know, Jim, Jim, um, uh, Ray Seahorn from Better Call Saul was, was in the cast. She played the girlfriend. John Hamm played Stinker. Philip Baker Hall from Boogie Nights, um, and others, uh, you know, played, Andy Richter was in it, Paul F. Tompkins. So because I just wanted to put out what I wanted to put out, good things have happened by by that and it was a good lesson for me and i had been in the industry for many many years but it did teach me that in the end you really do have to do what you want to do and you can't people can tell the difference you know if i write a piece for esquire and i don't like the idea you can sort of tell but if you're doing something from the heart um it may not sell a million may not be sold in an airport bookstore but at least you have the gratification that you did it and avenues tend to open up after you do that yeah that's incredible it's the internet has has allowed people to be people who are makers and and content creators you can create something and not need that that go between that third party that that person that would be the distribution arm you don't need that anymore it's everything i mean now if you make something great and you can push it you know it's a digital file and people want to find it and, and and discover it you you are so you're able to make something wonderful and let people find it and love it so much more than you were before you it's know? never existed in the history of publishing before the fact i mean when i was growing up and when you were growing up you couldn't do that i used to go get fanzines at tower records that was the extent of tower right so the fact now that you can potentially be read by as many people as those who read the new yorker by putting something online that's a tremendous freedom to the writer never has existed in the history yeah. before now there's a lot of stuff out there that's not good, but it's because of this freedom, there's also more out there that's better than has ever been out there before. There's yeah. a tremendous amount of great material out there. And also a freedom for the writer to be able to do this. And 
that has never, I mean, the, the frustration that I used to feel was that there was only a few avenues of publication. We know, real early on, it was Mad, Playboy, and New Yorker. And if you couldn't get into that as a, you know 18, 20-year-old, then you were kind of out of luck. Mm-hmm. That's not the case anymore. So there's a real power now that the writer has to be able to put out the product they want to put out. Though people still are dying to get into those publications, like they can put up, yeah. they can put up an article on Medium anytime they want, but to get accepted into the New Yorker or accepted into Mad or McSweeney's, I do think though that there, that's changing. I, I, I think there's a feeling of those who haven't been in the New Yorker or in Mad or in McSweeney's or in Vanity Fair or Esquire that your life will change afterwards. Maybe it does. It didn't for me. Um, uh, that's not to. I mean, it, it, they're very powerful publications. A lot yeah. of people read them, but they're also. Um, it, it is hard to get into them. You may not get as many pieces as you want into them, and you know, there's a lot of stuff out there now. The competition's. More. It seems like no one cares as much as you do that your name is in print. No, like when I was uh, in the uh, New York Press, I was so excited to be in print in this thing that was on every news, every uh, newspaper box on every corner in Manhattan, which is like the green paper boxes mm-hmm. next to the Village Voice, and there was the New York Press, and you would open it up, and there would be this newspaper, and there was a masthead, and it said illustrators, and it said Marty Dundix. And I loved that, and I was so happy, and I would show tons of people, and they couldn't care less. It's like, look at that, that's my name. They're like, great. Right. Well, that was your dream, right? <laughs> exactly. Right. It's like my dream was, was, was fulfilled, and no one really... But that, that's... <laughs> That's part of the problem. Like, you look around and you 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 know walk out of your apartment one day with a cape and a cane. Like, where is everyone? No one gives a flying shit. Yeah, you're like, I I achieved this thing. I thought this would be it. No one. Cares. No one cares. No. <laughs> but what does matter to you is to produce what you want, right? That, yeah, yeah. Th- that means more to you now, I would assume, than just having it's fun. Your name. So I think since I started this, since I started Weekly Humorous and started just like doing everything I wanted to do, because when I was at when I was at Lampoon, I was part of a company and I had you know things I had my role and I had tasks, and a lot of times I had tons of ideas and they didn't get done, you know, uh, because they didn't want to do them. It's a weird know? environment, though, right? It was very weird, but I think at, at any co- at any company you're at, let's say you're at you know any publication and you say I want to do all this stuff, and they're like, great, we don't want to do that right now. And because it's your idea, and it, you you want ownership of it. So when I started uh, Weekly Humorous, I had like a checklist of all these things that I had been working on in my mind, and I was like, I'm going to start this company, and these are all the things I want to do. Let's start doing them immediately. And I just started right out of the gate, and like boom, 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 boom. And I just I work a ton, but I mean it's fun because it's mine. That's the that's the difference. Anytime you're doing anything, you're going to love it so much more because it's yours. You have ownership. It's yours. No one could take it away. No one could take this away from me. No. And, and even though I'm not rich at all, and, but it's mine. And I think that's the difference. You well, know, that's I think that's why well, the entrepreneurial speak you, speak, spirit. But that's why I got into writing. Yeah. It wasn't to write Trump jokes for Esquire, right? I mean, yeah. you wanted to do um, – the best comedy is produced executive free, whether it's The Simpsons, early uh, Money Python – early SNL, what have you, that was always just people doing what they wanted. Yeah. Um, and that's not to say that everything's going to be a hit, but at least you are having fun doing it and you're putting out the product you want to put out. And you can't worry about every single thing being hilarious, you know? Well, you no one's going to find keep, it hilarious. You have to just keep going. I think people overthink things so much. You no, know, I think it's really important just, just to pull the trigger just and boom. keep moving. Because yes. Because if you... St- I, and I've known people like this. You know, you'll, you'll see them once every few years. You come back, they're still working on the same script. Well, at a certain point, either people will like it or they won't like it. Yeah. And you really just have to kind of not give a shit. I give a tremendous amount of shit. That's why I don't read readers' comments uh, because it would upset me too much. But I just do try to keep producing. And it's also – that's the only thing that – prevents me from being anxious, depressed, OCD, and all that. It's, it's just producing writing. Nothing else works. Yeah. Nothing. Alcohol helps, but not yeah. as much as creativity. <laughs> Your next uh, book now that's also available on Stitcher as an audio. Yes, that, that is Randy. Randy. And that's a book I found at a garage sale in Maryland written by a 30-something named Randy. Randy S., Randy S. We don't know his last name. Now he grew, he grew up in Potomac, and he came into money. His his mam died, let, leaving him her farm, 
and he turned into a suburban division where he now lives. He's sort of the president and the king of the division. And he hired someone to live with him for one year and write about that year, sort of like a um, Medici would in 15th century, uh, an arts patron in 15th century Italy. And this is that product, that book. And the is the voice, someone else mentioned this, the voice on the audio, is that a voice of a voice actor that is in Aqua Teen Hunger yes. Force? That's the first thing that someone... I know that voice. Dave Willis. Great Dave Willis. <laughs> he does an amazing job. This is on Stitcher. Oh, the book is available on Amazon. I turned that into an audio project, a four-hour audio project, in which Dave plays the character of Randy. It's awesome. He, he, Could this become a movie? I wanted to. Um, but, you know, this is another lesson I learned in in this crazy business. Unless you... You're, you're not going to be pulled up like... like uh, a hitter would from the minor leagues to the big leagues. Yeah. You have to write the script and then send it to people. They're not going to say, hey, can I buy that idea and do it? It's really about you telling them exactly what you want to do and exactly how it's going to appear on the screen. Have you written scripts before, screenplays I before? Have, yeah. I don't like it because I don't <laughs> like writing for free. And I don't like... <laughs> With the stuff I write, not to get read, is frustrating. Yeah, but you've written, you've read, you've written the book. The book is, yeah, everything's done. I wrote the script for the audio. Oh, okay, and um, that is a you are there type of audio. You yeah, know, this guy went out and recorded Randy in various situations, so it's like a fly on the wall type of thing. But I, I think it would make for a good TV show. I really do. I find a lot of things nowadays are no longer, I want to adapt that for a movie. It's, I want to make that into a series for streaming. Right. Which seems more lucrative and yeah. more fun. Right. So, and, the, and like, let's put this on Netflix. Let's put this on Hulu. Well, that's another thing that's changed. I mean, that didn't exist before. Yeah. Try getting a sitcom on an NBC, you know, 15, 20 years ago. It's not going to happen. But now there are so many people looking for so many different things. Apple TV. Yeah. Everybody's making content. YouTube, everything. Um, and that's a great thing for a writer, too. Yeah. Now, a lot of these happen, you know, they, they'll be on the air for a little while and then go off, but at least people get their chance to put on what they want. And, you know, you see stuff on there, like uh, Pen15 or something. Yeah. I just think this never would have been on before, and this is no. incredible. It's uh, very I mean, niche. Like, things that it can be, there is now, it's like now a time where it, it's good to be niche, you well, know? Right, because niche comedy is, why, is what we like. That's our sensibility. Yeah. It's not mainstream Q107 comedy. Like, the stuff that's on... Um, this is an interesting thing I noticed. So CBS All Access, right? CBS All Access is now the streaming service for CBS. And that's where they put the good stuff, apparently. That's where if you want a really highly Twilight well-produced... Zone. Twilight Zone, exactly. Mm-hmm. All the Star Trek stuff. So they put the idiot stuff that's general, blockbuster, you know, Big Bang, mm-hmm. is on network. Right. So it's like they, they hide their... Right. Their good stuff is on this thing you have to paywall, yeah. and then the free stuff that's like crowd pleasing, whatever, well, advertiser your, friendly is all on CBS. Like idiot comedies, like The Neighborhood but is that, ridiculously that's your bad. Sensibility, though, I mean, that's like saying they put the Clive Cussler novels up front, and um, all the, you know, the 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 uh, more uh, complicated literature in the back. Well, for yeah. us, that we like the complicated literature. Yeah. Most people are not watching no. what we like. Our sensibility is not seen. By millions of people. Have you watched the new Twilight Zone? I've seen three episodes. Because I caved, because I do watch idiot television from CBS, but then I don't have On Demand, so I had to get CBS All Access to watch Blood and Treasure, which is this summer's smash adventure hit. I have not seen that. It's really bad. Is it? It's so good, though. You like that, though. It's cheeseball, but uh, it's very Indiana Jonesy, right? But it's like tongue-in-cheek, and the writing is funny because it's, I think it, it, it knows it's cheese ball, so it kind of plays. Does it, it leans though? into it? Yeah. Sometimes I'll hear that and I think I don't know if they know. It knows. It, I think it knows. But because I had to miss it, so I had to sign up for like the CBS All Access to watch them, and then I got sucked in. And I'm like, well, I really want to watch Twilight Zone because it looked awesome, and it is awesome. I like it. Mm-hmm. I've had mixed. Re- Other people told me they don't like it. I watched like five in a row, and I thought it was great. But well, I mean, that's I, there mixed. were some I liked, some I didn't like. The Adam Scott one I loved. I loved yeah, Adam Scott. that was great. He's amazing. I thought that was fantastic. And the comedian one I did not like. It was a little obvious. Yeah, but a little too on the nose. Yeah. I think um, it was a good one to start with. 
Yeah, but you know, I think um, they. I, I grew up loving Twilight Zone. Just the fact it's back on the air, I think, is great. I love that sort of. And thing. I like that they're they're true. It like it's very Rod yes. Sterling. Oh, very you much know? so. Yeah, yeah. He does a good job. I and like did, yeah. they have the right guy. Like having him do it. He's a great host. He's great. Yeah. His movies are that type of psychological social satire. That's great. So I'm happy. Though I mean, like Black Mirror is similar but different. Well, Black Mirror is better in a production overarching. They're, well, satirical. They're way, bigger it's ideas. Genius. I haven't seen this season, which I heard isn't that great. But past seasons, I was just blown away. Insanely. You see, good. The John. Um, uh, John. Why do I keep forgetting? Uh, John Hamm, the Christmas special. Did you do you remember seeing that one where he uh, is? I don't want to give it away, but he he plays someone who's trying to convince someone else within another reality to uh, admit to guilt. Oh, no, I haven't seen that. Oh, one. you got to see it. it. It's a special. I think it's like an hour and a half. They have three different stories running through. It's absolutely okay. brilliant. I actually, you mentioned John Hamm. I have a question from one of my interns. Um, tell me about John Hamm. <laughs> How cool is he in real life, and does he smell like ham or a different lunch meat? Um, this is a list of things that the, the interns wrote called questionable questions. It's a terrific question. <laughs> Uh, he smells more like bologna. Okay, I can see that. No, he's the sweetest guy in the world. I mean, I, I, we did a live reading of Stinker Let's Loose in the San Francisco Sketch Fest last year, and he flew up. I don't know for that especially. I think he was involved with other things, but just could not have been nicer. How and cool is it to have all of those top co- comic people? Very surreal. Reading your yeah. made-up novelization of a 70s... It was very, very movie. Surreal. Not only that, but a friend of mine, Mark Rosso, wrote amazing music for it. This is available on Audible. Uh, the music is on Audible, but it's also available as a standalone CD and cassette, truck stop cassette tape. And it was a sold-out crowd at Castro Theater, and John Hamm and Paul F. Tompkins, Andy Richter, um, Busy Phillips uh, just did an amazing job. Wow. It was very surreal. And just being around those people, I, I got very shy. I didn't say much. And there was one instance where we all posed as a group. I, saw, I think yeah. I saw that. Picture. And I was trying to look good. <laughs> Unfortunately, they put me next to John Hamm, who's the most beautiful creature on earth. And I look like I just slithered forth from some sort of Louisiana swamp. I mean, I look, I don't look like I'm in touch with this reality, right? Uh, that, I don't know where I am in that photo. I, I was like woozy from how looking he was. You were in a of looking at John Hamm. And I don't really get too too focused on like celebrity, but there's like when you see someone that good looking, it's it's like scary. It's like a from someone from outer space. Or yeah, something. like an it's alien. Not natural. Yeah. And then, then there's me next to him, a bit, <laughs> little, little lizard. <laughs> but he was he's a, he was super nice, great guy. So what happens with the, something takes off like that? Uh, you know. Are you making plans for what's next with the Stinker universe? Is there yes. more stuff? There, well, we're, we must, we Scott Jacobson, a friend of mine who writes for Bob's Burger and used to write for uh, Daily Show, and we've written a lot of things over the years for Radar and other magazines. We wrote a book, um, uh, your Our Body, Our Junk, a Sex Manual. Anyway, we pitched it to Hollywood, and it recently got there is interest. <laughs> You were just like, hey, Hollywood. Oh, no, it wasn't like that at all. Well, we were at first. Love us. A lot of quizzical looks. And we pitched, I I can't really, I don't know if I can say the name, a very well-known, I I mentioned his name earlier, associated with the Twilight Zone. And he has a production company, and he has shown interest, and uh, hopefully we will be out in L.A. pitching that uh, later this month. But I do like to work on different things. Uh, I have the next version, the next novelization called Passable in Pink that comes out through Audible uh, in early September or October. And that is a John Hughes-type movie that supposedly came out in 1983. And that's going to be a a movie, a pretend movie that you're writing a novelization of. It'll be an audio first and then the book. Oh, audio first. Okay. Yeah. I've never done that before, but it'll be audio first, and six months later, the book will come out. So I'm noticing a lot more with, because of the rise of podcasting, which is so much fun because people act like there wasn't radio, you know? Like, radio was popular. Radio was before television. People loved it. And there was, like, radio shows that people tuned into every week, and they would listen together as a family, like a television show. And now, 
uh, podcasting has become popular and people are realizing, hey, we could do radio shows yeah, on podcasts and it. people will listen. It's very it, good for the writer. It's great. So yeah, Audible's doing that. a whole bunch of just, you know, Audible only yeah. shows. Yeah. So this would be a show. This How was, many episodes? Like, what's the process of making a basically a radio show? Well, it's not a radio show. It's an audio book. So it would okay. be 14, I think, chapters um, like Stinker. You download it uh, all at once. It's, okay. See, Brandy is on Stitcher, and it's, it's one episode per week. This would be so it's more of a serial, more of a serial, uh, and this is more of a uh, an actual audio book. But you're absolutely right, and a lot of people um, grew up not you know loving uh, radio comedy. My father's a huge fan. Whether it was mm-hmm. uh, Newhart was one of the best records I would listen to growing up. My dad had all the comedy well, records, all that stuff. But I mean, all even before comedy. that, like Bob and Ray or Gene Shepard. Uh, radio for comedy really works, yeah, and it's very writer friendly. And the fact people are getting back into it is a great thing because theater of the mind, yeah, and it's a writer's medium. You know, you can write whatever you want. You don't have to deal with uh, the visual aspect of it, which costs a lot of money. Costs a lot of money, yeah. which goes back to publishing and print. Like right. the word is powerful, and you don't have to worry about all the actors and lighting and locations and cameras just do it. and just, just do it. you just do it you can have something like you can write something and have it done today yeah and it could be wonderful or well, terrible that's another thing about uh publishing and like uh, these books i'm self-publishing yeah that's you know, amazing my previous books were through viking and random house and all that and that would take two years for that to come out and edits and, and changes everything, right and oftentimes they wouldn't get a certain you know joke or sensibility. So you or and, and this would happen every single time I wrote a book. The person, the editor who bought it, left. It happens every time. Or fired. Right, and they leave, and then you have to deal with a new editor who didn't buy the book and doesn't know about it and doesn't know, care, doesn't understand it. Yeah. So with this, I can I can write a book and put it I, literally from start to finish with stinker. I think it was six months. That's great. And that really is I I would rather have the quickness of it rather than waiting until fall of 2022 because you don't know what's going to happen in fall of 22 anything can happen between now and then yeah we're doing uh i'm publishing a book that's coming out september 12th one of my a team of my writers they write together um and they had been trying to get published they had meetings with publishers and they had no luck and they were shopping this book around and they um, the one guy, Andy Newton, works around the corner, and we have, like, uh, he has, like, summer Fridays, and he would hang out here and just enjoy the free beer, and we'd hang out. And he was complaining about, uh, he's, like, having a hard time finding a publisher, and I was like, how hard is it to publish a book? Make it publish a book. It's not hard. Publishing a book. Yeah. So uh, we looked up Google Humorous Books. See if that's anything. It's nothing. I'm starting it right now. Bought the domain name, set up the site. I'm now a book publisher. So You're you, my you first book. you own Humorous Books. Yeah. Is it the British spelling? No. Okay. Damn it. Are you going to buy that? Yes. <laughs> no. oh, shit. I'm buying them both. It's not hard. Right now. Anyone can put out a book. And I'm using Lulu to do uh, print-on-demand publishing. So they actually okay. make the books. Right, exactly. And I then use Ingram, but they, they're all good. They have all this. It's fine. It's not hard at all. So we just did the we did a cover, cover shoot for their book, um, and it's called uh, From the Campaign Trail or Thereabouts, and it's like a funny... It's a funny thing about it, it. It follows the 2016 election, but it's these guys who were on the campaign trail. But it's their lives. It's not actually. Huh. Not, it's not about the campaign as much as yeah. them having to be following yeah. the campaign around the United States. And um, so we did the cover art. We have that going. We have people that have read the book and have like giving us blurbs. Would you give us a blurb? Of course, I'll give yes! it to you right now. I loved it. Just going on right on the, the bottom front. Oh, Mike Sachs. I oh. loved it. It's going to be great. Uh, so, yeah, being a publisher, it's fun. Well, there's no difference. I mean, you have to do your own marketing and yes. editing anyway for the big publishers, really. I mean, all the work falls to you anyway. So why not just get it out onto your own imprint? I've noticed that with social media, with influential influencers, people, ca- they want you to do all the marketing for your project. Now. Oh, yeah. Like, it's like I, I don't know what these big publishers are doing other than physically just having the book made and then buying it in bulk, like putting up the money to have the book well, made. It, it's designed is mostly, what doing. and it is editing. But the editors are overworked, the designers are overworked, and when it comes to marketing, I don't understand what goes on. People are like, "Oh, 
uh, how many followers do you have on Twitter? Oh, you have this many. Oh, then we want to work with you. Right. You know, how many followers on Instagram? Oh, that sounds great. Right. Like, it's that's not, how... You're not selling an idea anymore. You're selling how many followers you have. Yeah. It's your brand. They want to know how you're going to market it. Yeah. And if you don't... Are you popular? We don't want to have to make you popular. Right. And they want someone already there. Yeah. Because it is a lot of work and there's a lot of competition. I mean, you, I work at Vanity Fair. We get hundreds of books a week. I mean, just piles and piles of it. And these are through traditional publishing. So when you throw in self-publishing too, there's, there is a lot of competition. You really do have to have to work hard to get to get the word out. It's, it takes a lot of work. And you're currently working at Vanity Fair. Yes. Do you write for every issue? No, no, no. It's the editor uh, on the editorial staff. I used to write more um, for when Graydon was an editor. Uh, we used to do a lot of more humor. Um, that sort of fallen by the wayside, but it's just a day job, you know. It's just so I can come home at night and write about uh, 1977 truckers named Stinker. Absolutely. Um, you've written a bunch of books where you've interviewed uh, writers and comics. Well, n- more ri- comedy writers rather than comedy writers. writers. Yeah. Um, what are uh, like the overarching lessons you learned yeah. from those kind of guys? Well, there are a few overarching lessons, and really, one was what, what we were discussing before. You don't go into it for the money. Hmm. You go into it for the love. And you have to do the humor that interests you, what you want and how you want to do it. If you do it for trying to impress publishers, editors, executives, it'll usually come across as false. You know, it won't, it won't ring as true. So you really do have to remain true. Another thing I learned is everyone... It's, it sounds like a joke when I tell people it is completely true. And the sooner I learned this, the happier I was, that everyone is miserable. And meaning that everyone wants to do something else. You know, if you are writing for TV, you want to write for the movies. If you write for movies, you want to write books. If you write books, you want to write for podcasts. Everyone wants to do something else seemingly because it's easier and it's better. But, you know, there's a problem in any medium. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a healthy thing to want to do different things. But I think it's also healthy not to be 100% content and to know you're not going to be. I mean, when you have someone who is in his 90s like Mel Brooks, who's still not content or fulfilled, that's why he got to where he is. Mm-hmm. Not because, He's not lying by a beach uh, relaxed. He's still pushing. He's still hungry. And I think that is a very healthy thing. Which leads me to the next point, which is you... There's going to be ups and there's going to be downs, probably more so than there would be if you were working in an office building off of I-95 outside of Severna Park or Rockville, where I grew up, um, you, where you know what to expect every day. You don't, you don't know what you're going to expect here. So the highs are going to be high, but the lows are going to be low. Yeah. Um, and you just have to keep going. You can't stagnate. You have to keep moving forward. And if you do, um, you, you'll, you'll feel healthier and the writing will, will feel healthier and it's just a, a, a better place to be rather than rather than stagnating and and you know it's a, that's a terrible place to be when you stagnate um, when you lash out at the world for not getting in this publication or you're upset because this story isn't working or you're jealous of this that's a form of writer's block and that's a bad place to be so yeah. you really do have to just keep moving down the path and I, it's a path you're forging you're not following a path you're forging it yourself I think the thing that I've realized and that you have done is we've taken the equation of having someone else's approval or someone, some other gatekeeper being in our way. Like instead of having to submit to a, a New Yorker, I just, I made my own, like I made my own magazine right. and I'm like, I can, and I don't even publish stuff in my own magazine cause I'm too busy. Like I should be putting cartoons and illustrations in my own magazine that I'm done. But I'm like, Oh, I have, I have too many good things from other people. So I'm publishing their stuff right. and not my own. Well, but I, it's the difference between gambling in a casino and owning the casino. Yeah. When you own the casino. You can't, you're going to be the winner. Right. But I mean, with that said, I don't want to talk people out of getting in the New Yorker. I mean, right. the, it's a fantastic place to be. The editors are incredible there the best in the business. Um, It's just, if you're writing for the New Yorker pieces that don't interest you and that aren't your sense of humor, then at the very least, write for yourself and self-publish or put it elsewhere, create your own zine or whatever. But And also, though, getting into a big, getting into a New Yorker, getting into Mad, does bring other projects to you. you. Like Bob Eckstein is in a lot of those publications and being in that magazine gets him 
book offers. Of book course. Jobs, you know, yeah. like, so like, it's a great way to get yourself well, out there. He's a major talent, but he, I think he's working it smart. Yeah, you know, he's, Bob's great. You know, he's he's working the mainstream like a New Yorker, and he's also doing stuff on the side that's a little weirder. That it's almost like working the two a.m. stage as a comic. You know, you work for the the tourists and and those at ten p.m. and then at two a.m. you work for other comedians. And I think yeah, he, I think that's I think that's the right way to do it to have a dual path, uh, and and to work different angles like that. And just he just keeps moving, and that's an example of someone who just keeps moving forward. Yeah. He's always putting out something. He always, always has a book. He's yeah, always, always like I'll get a book in the mail. Like his new. I'm I like know. I didn't even know you were working on this. It's already published yeah, and it's well, amazing. God bless. I mean that. That's why he's a success. He hustles. And he's a hustler. You have to be a hustler. There's a lot of competition out yeah. there. And that doesn't mean you be a jerk, but you just have to hustle um, and just and just push forward. And you know he has done that, and good things have happened. So he was on. This was funny because I saw this interacting this interaction on Facebook that one time. I think. It was your uh, NPR a fan fiction piece went up, and then Bob was on Fresh Air, right? With Terry Gross, yes. And he like showed her yeah, the article, <laughs> and and he said she was sickened by it. I <laughs> and love the article that. is so funny. This is an article that's like a fan fiction about a, kind of like a post apocalyptic vampires, and they're in uh, DC, and it's all of the anchors for NPR. So it's like Sam Simon and it's Terry Gross and it's all the, all the big names, but they're all like Scott Simon, Scott Simon. And they're all like sexualized and (laughs) it's really hot and steamy. Yeah. It's real steamy. Uh, You know, she, uh, Terry Gross, um, takes a shower beneath a waterfall and pleasures herself as the birds twitter in the background. That is, that's a very personal thing. NPR, because I grew up in DC Outside D.C. and NPR is an obsession down there. So oh, yeah. every time I was being driven somewhere, it was NPR, NPR, NPR. And I sort of had a, a, a stick up my ass about NPR because I never found the comedy funny. And also, I grew up around Mark Russell and Capital Steps and all that. All oh, the Capital Steps that I always hated. So <laughs> it was kind of nice. My mom would always. We're going to the Capital oh, Steps I this went weekend. So many times. Bomb, 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 bomb. I ran. <laughs> bomb, bomb, bomb. You just want to fucking shoot your head out. It was horrible. So that was sort of my answer to to. How you know how I feel about NPR, which is how, why I'll never be on Terry Gross. <laughs> you never know, Terry. We're waiting for the call. I'm sure she's listening live. Oh, NPR. I love to listen to NPR. I have it on the background all the time. I'm like a talk radio person. I'm not. I'm so I just music. put it on whenever I'm like in the it's house like doing noise. stuff. It's white noise. Yeah. I just like hearing this. Like it drives me crazy. I can't listen to it. I cannot. Well, I can listen to hard news, but not pop culture. I would stuff. listen to in the in my car growing up in suburban Maryland. I had a old uh, station wagon Oldsmobile with the fake wood paneling, and the radio only got AM, so it was only WTOP oh, news sure. radio fifteen hundred. Yeah, yeah. And that's all I could have. Right. It's the only thing that would be on in my a car. A lot of commercials on fifteen hundred. Ah, top news instantly. Did you listen to um... news radio fifteen hundred? WTOP. WTOP News Times is. I love knowing the news yeah. time. Well, I love also, it when they read the news. There was time. the weather on the this and the traffic on the that. I love it. Did you listen to Don and Mike? Yeah, I love those guys. I worked for uh, the Rouse and Company Morning Show on Good Time Oldies, one hundred five point seven WQSR, Catonsville, Baltimore. Wow, I, I, we didn't get that in uh, in DC. We had uh, one hundred four three, I think. Or mm-hmm. was- Big oldies. You had DC 101. Well, DC 101 wasn't oldies. No, you, that was that was, uh, was Elvis like and metal. Elliot. Yeah, it was new metal. Yeah, yeah. Because El, uh, Elvis Duran came went national, and he's on the Elvis Duran stuff that show. would play Hammerjacks. Yeah. Well, I mean, you were HF HF Festival ninety nine one HFS ninety nine one HFS Bob Wall, Rob Tim, yeah, the Morning Project, all those guys, the Weasel. Gina Crash, Gina Weasel. Crash, Rob Tim, Rob Tim, yeah, yeah, I, I love. I grew up with that. They all went to R and R in Annapolis, right? Is that still around? 103.1, mm-hmm. right? Because it's homegrown. It's yeah. p- privately owned by some family. Well, It'll the, never go away. The, there's, a, there's a WHFS documentary coming out. Do you know about this? <gasps> no. Yeah. The filmmaker got in touch, and uh, maybe I got in touch with him because I heard about it. Super excited. I'm very excited. They sent me some uh, clips from it. And it's like, that's my childhood. Like, all yeah. those voices. Even Surf is, is, is interviewed. He, he was... On uh, HFS in the seventies, playing Little Feet. And, uh, Little Feet. And I went to a Little Feet concert in Baltimore. You had, if you grew up in Maryland, you had to go to a Little Feet yeah. concert. I, d- I did. I loved Inner Harbor. 
I loved HFS. I mean, my childhood was H. I listened to the. I remember I had like a Walkman. I would listen to the Walkman as I was mowing the lawn on mm-hmm. the weekends. And it would oh be, yeah. I love the radio. Like I love the commercials. Well, what else do we have? I mean, there wasn't internet radio. No. You know, we'd have to listen to uh, H. We didn't have to, but that was the best of the bunch. Even though that became very mainstream HFS. Calling a radio station and talking to the DJ and requesting a song is something that you could just like touch this celebrity. I, know, I and still interact remember with them. doing it. It happened a handful of times, and I still remember where I was when I would do it. It happened once in New Orleans when I lived down there. I uh, requested Ichiku Park by the Small Faces, and I remember exactly where I was when I called in. And he said, "Great idea." And then it came up a few minutes. I mean, it was just like a power. You tape it. I would tape the oh, yeah. song with my cassette. Yeah. And you'd, so you'd get like the end of the positioner, you know, <laughs> right, it'd be like yeah. 991 HFS. And then you push the record button. I remember calling B104, which was the best music. It was like yeah, hit music. It was B104. It was Brian and O'Brien in the morning. Oh, I could talk about radio all day. I love radio. It's, it's a shame because like PLJ here in New York just went off the air. What is PLJ? What number is that? Um, 90, was it 99.7 or 90? It was like, it was one of the oldest hit music stations in New York, I listen WPLJ, to a fantastic Scott and Todd in the morning. Yeah, I don't listen to any of that. I always listen now to internet radio, Ohio FM, which is the best. There's no DJ. There's no upcoming events. It's just alternative music. Okay, OPB, Colorado. I mean, all this stuff you'll find under eclectic under iTunes. Mm-hmm. That's what I love. They're just middle of nowhere radio stations. Yeah, I mean, sometimes literally, there's one in um, Brisbane, Australia, which is like either twelve hours ahead or fifteen behind or whatever. And you can email them requests. They will take requests. Do they say your name? I've never heard my name. Oh. Someone, uh, it's funny, this whole comedy world is a lot of fun, all this online humor writing, right? So, like, I kind of, towards the end of working at National Lampoon, which was more based in the movie world and the TV world and trying to get into stuff, there was always a website, but it wasn't like, they were doing more non-traditional writing and they weren't doing cartoons anymore. And then with Weekly Humorist, it's much more cartoons, articles. Like, that's our main thing. And I've got uh, to meet so many amazing writers who are spread all over the United States. It's so much fun because it's not just about East Coast, West Coast anymore. And there's a lot of overlap with people who know people, right? So I know these writers. Then I realize, oh, we all have mutual friends. Yeah. Oh, we it's all have mutual friends. Community. It's a small community. So uh, y- your name pops up a lot amongst really? a ton of different people. From like, the women? No, never. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm next to John Hamm again. <laughs> uh, Brian Boone. Oh, yeah. Brian Boone pops he's a great up. Guy. Brian Boone, he's a great all guy. Guys are great. Such a funny writer. Oh, nice. And then I read, I think it was, um, there was a magazine called The Writer Magazine that I got profiled in for Weekly Humorist next to. Uh, uh, Emma Allen for the New Yorker, uh, Chris Monks, yeah. and um, the Belladonna uh, women for the oh, I read Caitlin. That. Yeah, I was profiled in there too, yes, and Brian were. Boone was profiled for Sportsider yes, right. at the time. And that. he mentions how you like ushered in him to be writing and, and working. Oh, in, right. Well, that was that was for what was the thing in it? Uh, yes. Well, that was for Adult Swim. Adult and Swim. That, yeah. that was one of the worst experiences I ever had. That was that was a nightmare. That was under Turner. And that was a an experience. What that, was that? It was an online video thing. Well, it became they wanted to do an online humor magazine, right? And then it became very, very, very controlling. And you can't do this, you can't do that, but you should do this, and you should have to super do deluxe, right? I was it super I deluxe? I don't even remember the name of okay. what, what it was, but I, I ran it for a few months, and it was awful. And I, I promised myself I would never do that again. And the, so that, what he talks about glowingly, I look back at it as just like, oh. <laughs> this was the worst time of my the life. The worst. <laughs> it's not easy being an editor, as you know. No. It is not easy. You know, are you, do you want, like this piece? Why don't you get back to me? Uh, are you sure it's not funny? Can I do this? And... The worst thing that I experience is the, the fear of missing out where I don't get back to someone fast enough and then you see it picked up someplace else and it's hilarious and it's like a viral sensation you're you like get back pretty quickly though. darn it um i get back pe- pretty quickly if yeah. something's like like a, you know i try i don't i don't write everybody back do, i get overwhelmed do you notice a lot of kids not kids but teenagers early 20 somethings are are submitting uh yeah um i think a lot of people are submitting 
there's a new there's a new rise of of online humor writing culture. There's like Facebook groups. Mm-hmm. There's uh, a lot of uh, binder groups, a lot of female writing groups that are very yep. um, supportive, and they have a lot of accountability. It. Where it's yeah. like, have you submitted this week? Have yeah. you submitted how many pieces? Have you like they really push themselves? They're very assertive, and I mean, like ninety percent of the writing, um, I think, in some weeks for Weekly Humorous are all female. I love writers. It. That's fantastic. But I'm like, what's yeah. going on with the guys? Come on, guys. You're, yeah. You're, you're well, you know pick what? Up it's, slack. it's the women's term. You know, yeah. It's uh, I, the, what I found is for print, the women are blowing it out of the water. Like we're talking funny. about Caitlin before that book that that group put out. Yeah. Uh, it's fantastic. Well, her online classes through Second City, um, she developed this uh, online curriculum for humor writing. That there are now other people that have. I think maybe we're in her class and now teach like level one or different versions of her class. And it's like more and more teachers and more and more students. And it's like this, it's creating this community, this online community of all these writers who are learning how to write better. Like they're funny, but like you're not doing it right. Well, there's also more female uh, TV executives. I think that's why Pete Penn 15 got on the air and that's a work of genius. I mean, that show is unbelievable. A lot more female editors like Emma, Alan at uh, New Yorker, she's great. So I think, you know, in, in the past, there would be these middle-aged guys who didn't necessarily understand mm-hmm. some of the pieces that were coming in. And that, I, that I think, um, you know, I think the humor now is richer for yeah. more of this. It's- I sometimes get, I, I'll get the news because of the pieces coming in. Like, I'll, I'll be kind of offline for a day or two. Maybe it's the weekend. And then all of a sudden, I'll get like 10 pieces that are all about big dick energy. And I'm like, <laughs> what is uh, going my- on? Yeah, you know what's going on. Mike Sachs has been on Twitter. <laughs> I'm like, what is all this big dick? Like, did something happen? What? And I'll Google it. I'm like, oh, this is a thing. Oh, Mike Sachs is a big dick. Oh, it's all about Mike Sachs. Yeah. He exposed himself accidentally at right. the Subway sandwich at uh, place in Park Slope. again. <laughs> Here we go again. Someone's getting banned again <laughs> from the Dave & Busters. Go. You can't exchange that for tickets. No, you cannot. <laughs> Do you have an awkward or cringeworthy story, Mike Sachs? I feel like you have a lot. I have so many. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, I think the most cringeworthy... Well, you know what's funny? It's not really cringeworthy that I think back on now. It's how I treated people. I have a 10-year-old daughter, and I see how she is sometimes treated and how she treats others. And I, I think back specifically to being very mean, and I regret it terribly. Really? Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, there's there's one instance in particular that I was mean, I think out of embarrassment more so than anything, but I almost want to, to get in touch with the, the woman, now a woman, then an eighth grader, and apologize. Um, I just wasn't nice. And that, that bothers me more than anything. Um, I was listening uh, a while ago, not too long ago, but it was an episode of Doing It With Mike Sachs, which was your... A uh, very interesting and, and layered uh, podcast. Is there still new episodes of doing it with Mike? Sachs? They'll be coming up. I just put it on hiatus. And your podcast, if you haven't listened to it, please go listen to doing it with Mike Sachs because it's not just like this. Like this is easy. Just two people talking is pretty simple. Yours is not simple. Yours is layered. There's stuff. It's deep. Well, that has to do with with. Um... Rob Schulte, the producer, he's the one who layers it. But there is a lot of writing too. I mean, that's. I it think, was one. It was you. It was you ta- calling like an ex girlfriend. Well, that I, over and over that's again. My next project. I, I'm going to reach out to more ex girlfriends, ex managers, <laughs> ex lovers. Uh, it'll be. Was uh, that real? No. Okay. I'll, I'll it to. sounded so real. A lot of people. <laughs> well, I made the mistake of using my first girlfriend's real name. Oh. And that was played at a high school reunion, and everyone thought that was real, and they thought I was insane. Because what I do yes. is I call up my first girlfriend, or one of my first girlfriends, who's now a pediatric neurosurgeon while she's on rotation, and I bother her with questions about why she broke up with me. Yeah. And obviously, it's not a good time. No. No, I can't quite sense that. So when people did hear it, they're like, what the fuck is and matter with him? And it, I didn't know Jenny became a pediatric neurologist. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds so real. Yeah. And she is such a good actress. Well, you know who that is? It's Ted Travelstead's lovely wife, uh, who is an actress, and she's amazing. Um, Ted Travelstead is a writer, actor, friend of mine. 
Uh, so Julie Wright is her name, and she pulled it off. I mean, she's, that's just her acting. She's incredible. And your acting was good. You sounded like yourself, kind yeah. of like an annoying well, version I, of yourself. Right. Well, it, it wasn't me acting. I was just <laughs> literally reacting to, to her. And it was all every word was scripted, so it wasn't that hard to do. Yeah. But actually, I do want my next project to be just three hours of that. That would be interesting. Yeah. That's kind of like... A theater of the mind we're just it's cringy it, the whole thing is cringy mm-hmm. because it's it starts out being like oh this is uncomfortable and then it gets worse and then it gets worse yeah it's it's really a horrible person i mean i <laughs> yeah. play a horrible person <laughs> awful horrible person that's great so we're looking forward to a new season of that um i think so i think uh it come fall uh we're gonna pick it back up again and is that every week is that a weekly thing? That's you can't keep that up. It was at first, and then I thought, forget it. You know, everyone was saying you got to do it weekly. You got to do it weekly. Um, you know, podcast executives and such. Yeah, I can't do it. So it, we turn into bi bi monthly. It's way too hard because yeah. yours is much more of a show. Yeah, it's more like listening to a radio show. Yeah, it's it's a lot of writing. It's like a sketch show. Yeah, it's it's sort of um, fire sign theater. If that was good, <laughs> no, <laughs> I never actually listened to fire sign theater. But it's like it's surreal and hopefully funny. And hopefully, like Bob and Ray and Gene Shepard and all those uh, early comedy shows that I used to listen to on cassette tape. Oh, who's your favorite, um, like, uh, comedic inspiration? Who's your comedy, like, hero? I have hero? Um, a group, um, Albert Brooks, David Sedaris, Bob Odenkirk. Uh, these are people who, George Carlin, uh, Richard Pryor, David Letterman, Chris Elliott in particular, actually. Chris Elliott, Chris yeah, Elliott, get a life. When he was on letterman i was obsessed and that was when i was really young and i would tape it i would stay up and watch it and i I, to this day i know those routines better than those guys do i like i'm friends with adam uh resnick who was a writer on that show and wrote for um for uh, chris and i know chris a little bit and i'm always repeating sketches which to them they haven't heard in like 40 years there's just something they had to do that day but to me, I just I was obsessed with that sensibility. Late night was so funny back when Letterman was inventing it yes. because it was so weird. Oh, so and weird. he didn't have a budget Mm-mm. and he didn't have any guests really sometimes. Well that's so. another one. Meryl Marco invented that sensibility, helped invent it. She's yeah. a genius and she's out there still writing great books and she's doing T V now too. So that's another influence that I had. Um she is amazing. She's on social media on Twitter and all that. Yeah, she writes does she do stuff for Bystander? Yes, she does. Yeah, I thought yeah, yeah. she does a lot of stuff. I mean, th- that show is really her sensibility, and she doesn't get named enough. But that that early, those early years, late night more so than late show. Yeah, uh, that was just. Uh, it was almost like it, you were in a clubhouse watching it with a few friends. It was a clubhouse. It was, it was weird. like it was like being a part of the club, and it was as scary as it was weird. So I mean, some of those Chris Elliott characters were scary. Like that scared me. It was the guy scary. And it was violent. Yeah. <laughs> It wasn't necessarily violent. It would it would be like you know they would shoot somebody and they would have like a blood packet and right. they would just be dead. Right. You know, they like, would do a lot of it was extreme sixties like parody TV. Yeah, uh, like the fugitive. That's yeah, the guy, that thing. But yeah, it was weird, weird stuff. And I um, that's what I grew up on. And I don't really watch late night anymore. It's just too much. I, I don't. Yeah, I don't know what to even look at anymore. Everything's very everything's very slick. You know, well they don't have that kind of. Uh, do it yourself look anymore no, everything is sort of um catered to the three minute video to be shown the next morning yeah although i should say conan is the writing in that show is still fantastic yeah that writing is just that's like comedy writers comedy writer that's just great stuff i saw um mike reese yes did a talk at cooper union two weeks ago and he's so funny he's great He's just like yeah. old school kind of, yeah. you know, he's just funny. He's yeah, not trying to be anything. No, he's he's just funny. him. Yeah. And yeah. He didn't take a course to be funny. This right. is just who he is. And he tries to, you know, you give a lecture, but it's not like you can teach anyone this. Mm-hmm. But it's just like The Simpsons. Oh, yeah. And The Simpsons are so con- just consecutively funny. I tell you, I'm watching it now again because my daughter's into it. I haven't watched it in years. And it's still f- really funny. I mean, the writing... Is really good. It holds up. It is solid, and, and it's, it's just like packed, jokes, 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 packed. jokes. Yeah, it's comedy, Object. comedic density it's, is what. Yes, uh, right. I don't know if you know uh, Steve Kerper is a, a a friend of mine. He's a kind of a comedy writer who he did uh, this thing called uh, 
of Pirate TV for HBO years and years oh, ago. Oh, I remember Pirate TV. And he'd always talk about comedic density, and he turned me on to Army Man. Oh, sure. Right? Yeah. And it's just like so much is happening in mm-hmm. this. <laughs> well, that was a precursor to The Simpsons. Yeah. A lot of those writers went on to write for The Simpsons. Yeah, that, if you can find a copy of that, that's, uh, that, that's what George Meyer, who was an early Simpsons writer and wrote for Late Night, put out three issues of Army Man. And that's pre-internet, like we were talking about before. He just Xeroxed them. and a zine. A friend. It's a zine. And um, for a long time, you couldn't find them anywhere. I think now you can start to find. That had some Jack Candy? In it? Jack think, Andy was in it. I think that was a, a beginnings of yeah. Deep Thoughts was in Army Man. No, Deep Thoughts was even earlier, uh, early National Lampoon, and even before that, I think some uh, Texas or New Mexico yeah. uh, newspaper. But Jack Handy's amazing. He's brilliant. And yeah, I, I actually got to interview him for the podcast. He's super nice. And um, he's not writing anymore. Steve Martin, he said Steve Martin asked him to write for the Oscars or some live show and he said no i just i don't want to do it he says i have fuck you money now i just don't want to write anymore but he does stuff for does he do like bystander i don't know i guess i got him to write one thing for me um and bob Eckstein did the cartoon what was the thing it was um how to portray me in the movies <laughs> oh, oh God, that's good I'll, I'll send it to you yeah, it was yeah. great but it took um it took like a year for him to write me back like I asked him to write something. Email? Yeah, hmm. I, I and then he wrote me back, and then he's like, "Well, maybe something like this." And that was like six months later, and then he wrote <laughs> me back, and he's like, "How about this? You can you can use this." And then that was it. That's awesome. And then uh, never heard from him again. <laughs> and I was like, "Thanks, <laughs> well, this is it's great." Jack Handy, that's all you need. To and do. it was amazing. And I, I I envisioned him just in New Mexico, like living just he off is in the New grid. Mexico. Yeah, yeah. He lives a good life. He worked for it. Yeah. So what do you got coming up? What do you got coming up this summer? Any big plans? Um, well, um, I'm editing now the uh, audio, audio book for Audible for P- Passable and Pink, an amazing cast, which I'm not allowed to talk about. So this is high school. This is high school. Coming of age. Coming of age. And right now I'm working on the third novelization, which is uh, an early 90s grunge movie, like Singles and... Oh, nice. And that other piece of shit that I always hated, the um, uh, the Ben Stiller movie. Yeah. What was that called? I always forget. Reality Bites. Reality Bites. Yeah. So this will be a takeoff on that. Cool. Isn't it fun how all of our great memories are coming back into fashion now? Yeah. Well, you wait around long enough. (laughs) I mean, the 1890s will come back in fashion. It's all going to reboot. It's great. Um, And then you age out and you die. Yeah. And then we all die anyway. Yeah. Can you tell how many listeners we have listening live? Um, How many thousands? 25,000. Holy shit. Are listening right now. Yes. Yeah. Unbelievable. Isn't that incredible? That is super. When is this going to run? Like tomorrow? Love it. Is that okay? Fresh. Yeah, very yeah. fresch. You know, this is topical stuff. Yeah. If this goes up in two weeks, it's not going to make any sense. No. You want it evergreen, baby. Yeah, very evergreen. Um, you're active on Twitter. Yeah, I love Twitter. I'm, a, I'm addicted to the Twitter. Um, it, it's really an outlet. It's a steam valve. Yeah. And there's an addiction, too. I mean... You you want people to like your stuff, and if they don't, you put up something very fun. Uh, you put up fun, random things all the time. Yeah, not really tethered to no anything except Trump, which whom I despise, but I will talk about him more than anyone else currently. No. But usually they're just kind of little silly stories. You had a photo today of was it a, a bunch of a bunch of ladies in a boat? Oh, yeah, that was um, yeah, that was not a joke. I mean, I just liked that shot. That was nineteen thirty three. A camp in Maine. Actually, my daughter's going to camp for the first time in Maine. I just, you know, having a daughter, you just become much more nicer. I think. Yeah. I think you bec- your estrogen kicks in a little bit. Did you see the new Lego movie? I've seen them many, many times. Those are funny. They're brilliant. First of all, those movies, and I rewatched Toy Story movies uh, in anticipation of Toy Story Four, which my daughter's looking for. Those stories are genius. Um, Inside Out. Did you see that movie? No. The animated movie? I mean, it's like a work of art, that script. It's just flawless. It has to be because you can't improvise and the characters can't sell anything. You know, everything is written. Do you think that they, I think that they they write some of these movies and they add great jokes that maybe the kids don't get 
because they know the parents are going to be going to the movies too. So they're making movies for the parents and the kids. Absolutely. There's almost two movies happening. Right. But it really comes down to the characters and the story. And it's just outrageous how they can do it. I mean, I, in a million years, I couldn't write anything like this. It's just so nuanced and so layered. Um, it really has shown me, uh, it made me appreciative of these movies. Yeah. I mean, Toy Story movies are the classic movies. And they take so long to make. Like, yeah, they can write I mean, this script, then it's like, okay, great, we'll see you in five years. Well, the difference between animation with the first one and the second and third, and I'm sure now with the fourth, is tremendous. I mean, the first one came out, what, 20 years ago? Mm -hmm. And you, you can see, especially with the human features, it's not as nearly as good as it became. But the writing is so strong, and the character you feel for the characters so much, it's really a good lesson. I mean, if you feel for a toy... yeah. Uh, that's what we need as humans. We're wired to want characters and story, and that those movies really provide it. What advice can you give listeners about being a comedy writer? Real quick. Uh, What's the nice bite-sized uh, life lesson? Just write what you want, how you want to do it, and don't stop. Just write every day? I would, if not writing every day, think about writing every day or network or research or, or read something or just work towards that writing every day. You don't have to write every day, but I, I do think it's valuable to do something positive every day that affects writing. And yeah. reading a lot helps, and not just the good, but also the bad, knowing what not to do. And no, maybe knowing why something is bad. Like, why well, exactly. why doesn't this work? Exactly. I don't want to write like this. Exactly. Why knowing? And read everything, whether it's a um, propaganda leaflet from the 40s, whether it's a, uh, you know, a, a retirement home a newsletter, you know, whatever it is, anything is valuable. Yeah. And the more you read, especially the stuff off in the corners that other people aren't reading, can only help you that much more. It's great advice. Thank you. From the very accomplished Mike Sachs. Thank you. I'm so accomplished. I'm about to take a bus home. The, <laughs> <laughs> the multi-talented and multi-layered Mike Sachs. More like a lasagna. The legendary comedy everything. Follow Mike Sachs at Michael B. Sachs on Twitter. Yes, Michael B. And uh, you email me. I don't care. MikeBSachs at gmail.com. Make sure you put the B in because there's another Mike Sachs that I'm actually close with. He's a great guy. And he's really good looking. So we always used to have mail. I used to get his mail, which was from women and homosexual men wanting to set up a date. Yeah. And he used to get uh, emails meant for me just from, you know, like 40-year-old shut-ins about comedy. Yeah. So we would we, we befriended each other because of that. So his is MikeSax at gmail.com. Mine is MikeBSax at gmail.com. Yeah. So if you want, a, like, a good-looking Mike Sax. Well, he's, he's really good-looking. And so. uh, some people have confused me for him and then saw me live and were very disappointed. And then maybe it became like the John... <laughs> the John Hamm. <gasps> I, did see, I did see the John Hamm group photo of you and John Hamm. Oh, if you could put that up on your site. I will. <laughs> you look dazed. <laughs> I'm trying to be cool. Uh, that is me trying to look... That's my best shirt. Yeah, I look like I'm not cognizant of reality. Right? It's like John Hamm just accidentally elbowed you in the face, and you're just and like, oh! He's just looking delightful, as yeah. I'm sure your interns know. And uh, then there's me, this Huckleberry next to him. <laughs> Huckleberry. Perfect. Well, thanks for being on. This was great. I'm so happy. Thank you. It's good to see you again. It's been way too long. And let's get together with our friend. Who, Lou? Yes. Ah, Lou. Lou. We'll get together with Lou. You know, he's a big deal at Netflix now. I know, now. I know. Uh, I got to go see a taping of Patriot Act. Ooh, really? Uh, uh, yeah, he let me in and everything. It was amazing. Guy. I haven't seen him in a long time. Let's do it. He's looking well. He always looks younger every time I see him, and I, I always look worse. I always look older. <laughs> he looked really good. And actually. he looks better. Ugh. It's just success. It is. Um, this is Talk Word. I'm Marty Dundix, editor-in-chief of Weekly Humorous Magazine. Please check us out at weeklyhumorous.com. Sign up for our weekly e-newsletter. And uh, come out to the Guaranteed Delivery Comedy Shows, everybody. Mike, you got to come to that. It's the first Tuesdays of the month. It's stand-up. It's downstairs in the mail room. It's one from Wall Street. It's a lot of fun. Um, so go, um, go to that because I need people to, to show up and buy drinks. Please. I'm very lonely. Hey, this is Talk Word. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye.